I began discovering the Episcopal Church in the spring of 1985. I was in my last semester at Elon College in North Carolina. A professor of mine knew that I was interested in mainline Christianity, and he suggested one time that we go to Holy Comforter Episcopal Church in Burlington, North Carolina, near my college. And that was my first experience in an Episcopal church. I have to tell you, nothing special seemed to happen, at least on the surface. No bells went off. I didn't get a lightning strike of clarity as to this is your new church. But I was there, and it was pleasant, and the seed was planted about the Episcopal church. It's important for me to note, and this will factor into the sermon uh, at the end of the sermon, I would never have gone there if I had not been invited. This professor knew of my interest in liturgical worship, and he invited me to go with him to Holy Comforter Church. A few weeks later, he said, you ought to experience a bigger Episcopal church. So we went to Holy Trinity in Greensboro, North Carolina, about 20 miles away. Again, it was pleasant, but no bells went off. Uh, was not struck with a lightning bolt of clarity about this is your new church. But it was pleasant. And again, the seed was planted about the Episcopal Church. And again, I would not have been there had I not been invited. After college, I went immediately to Candler School of Theology, Emory University in Atlanta, in the heart of the city. I was country come to town. Seriously. A small town boy suddenly in the midst of a major world-class city and university. I looked around in the Emory area for a church, but really didn't find anything that really struck me. And so months after I got there, a second career student in a class with me said, by the way, have you found a church yet in Atlanta? And I said, no, I've looked, but I haven't found one. I said, well, Jim and I, my husband, we go to St. Philip's Cathedral. Why don't you meet us there some Sunday? And we'll sit with you and we'll help you learn the ropes of the service. So I did. I had no reason not to respond to a gracious invitation. So at St. Philip's, the bells did ring. And the lightning bolt came. This is the church you've been looking for, this liturgy, this tone, this way of worship. The woman who invited me was named Laura Groton. Her husband's name was Jim. Without the invitation, I never would have gone. And who knows, I might not be here today without these gracious invitations along the way. Not long after becoming an Episcopalian, I figured out the importance of coffee hour. <laughs> it turns out every Episcopal church anywhere of any size has coffee hour. Coffee hour is when we greet our friends and establish again the community that we all enjoy. Periodically though, we all need to be reminded, coffee hour is primarily intended to be a time to greet newcomers. Of course we enjoy seeing our friends. Of course, we do and should. But the main reason to have coffee hour is to welcome newcomers. And in a church like St. Luke's, it doesn't have to be a newcomer to the parish. They may just be new to us. But it's always good at coffee hour to extend a hand and say, hello, I don't think we've met. My name is. We welcome one another in the name of Christ. So yes, the Episcopal Church is known for the prayer book. We're known for our liturgy. We're known for our historic connection with the Church of England. But we're also known for coffee hour and what it stands for. A number of years ago, one of our youth, who's now a college graduate, but when he was younger, said in a place where the smell of coffee was strong, he said to his parents, this place smells like church. It's a wonderful observation. This place smells like church. 
to which the question is obvious, why do you say that? <laughs> coffee, I smell coffee. Smells like church. Why am I talking about coffee hour? Here's why. Jesus said, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Matthew 10, verse 1 through chapter 11, verse 1, is what we call the missionary discourse. There are five major discourses in Matthew's gospel, five distinct blocks of teaching. The first block is Matthew 5, 1 through 7, 29, the Sermon on the Mount. The second major discourse is Matthew 10, 1 through 11, 1. And we call it the missionary discourse. The first discourse is called the Sermon on the Mount. The second major discourse is called the missionary discourse. Here's why. Chapter 10, 1. Then Jesus summoned his 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. And then the next little passage is Jesus calling the disciples. And so it's the missionary discourse because this is where Jesus sends the disciples out to do ministry in his name. Then we read in verse 5, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. So the disciples have been called, now they're sent to do missionary work in the name of Jesus. Jesus does give them a dose of reality in verses 34 through 39, and this was part of last week's gospel lesson, when Jesus talks about the reality of division. Jesus does prepare his disciples for the reality that not everyone will hear and accept the invitation into the kingdom. So in that context of welcoming people, but understanding not all will welcome the disciples, Jesus then says, and this is part of today's gospel lesson. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. In commenting on today's passage, Fred Craddock writes, This text gives one an increased appreciation for the significance of the frequent biblical injunctions to practice hospitality. Thus the reference to coffee hour. Thus, the reference to being invited to those Episcopal churches back in the day. This passage is telling us in inviting others, in welcoming others, we are actually welcoming Jesus. And in welcoming Jesus, we are actually welcoming God. It's a powerful text. Somebody uh, mentioned early this morning, this may be the shortest gospel lesson of the year. And it might be. It's a tiny little thing, isn't it, in text. But just think about how important the message is. Jesus himself saying, whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And welcoming each other, we're welcoming Christ. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me in welcoming Christ. Jesus himself is saying, we welcome God. Commenting on this passage, N.T. Wright observes, whatever you do for Jesus, you do not just for Jesus, but for God. If Jesus' people today could relearn this simple but profound lesson, the church might once again be able to go out with a message to challenge and change people's hearts. Just think about the difference it makes to see each other not simply as sisters and brothers, which we are, and that's important, of course. But if we actually see Jesus in each other, how much more does that increase the importance of our time together? And if we can see Jesus in each other, then we can see God in each other. And that makes everything more important, doesn't it? If we're doing it all, really, in the name and for the sake of God in Christ. The 
17th century Anglican priest and poet George Herbert said, nothing is ever little in God's service. It's a wonderful one line to remember. Nothing is ever little in God's service. As our gospel lesson today indicates, even a cup of cold water <coughs> is important. The person who needs the water. But if we can remember that person represents Jesus. In effect, that person is Jesus. And that reference to Jesus leads us to remember. And Jesus links us to the Spirit of God. Nothing is ever little in God's service. Nothing seemingly insignificant is ever really unimportant. And then the 19th century poet Elizabeth Barrett Browning has written, all service ranks the same with God. From something heroic to a cup of water. If we do it in the name of Christ, in the name of God, it all adds up to a gracious invitation into God's kingdom. So at 8 o'clock this morning, I called him Prince Charles. I'm careful at 10 to say King Charles III. When King Charles III uh, had his coronation a couple of weeks ago, it put the focus on Westminster Abbey, that great house of worship in the heart of London. An Anglican priest named Michael Main was the dean, the senior pastor of Westminster from 1986 to 96. But before that, he had been director of religious programming for BBC Radio. And it was as director of programming for BBC Radio that Michael Main made a trip to Calcutta to interview Mother Teresa and to help people understand the significance of her ministry there in the heart of Calcutta with the poorest of the poor. So Michael Main made that trip and he interviewed Mother Teresa and in the course of that trip, he was introduced to a woman called Sister Luke. And Sister Luke was in charge of bathing people who had just been brought in off the streets and who in all likelihood were near death. Those in the most critical need were brought in off the streets and they were given a tender, loving, bath by these sisters as if they were Jesus himself treated with the same respect the same care it really made an impression on Michael Maine having traveled to Calcutta from the heart of London as he was watching these people be cared for so lovingly by these nuns Michael Maine realized that over the tub where these women were being washed, bathed, cared for, cleansed, there was a sign that said the body of Christ. And that's the point of all this. That person, to those nuns, that person who had no seeming significance to society, those nuns recognized in that person the body of Christ. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. So I'll close with this. There's been a lot of transition in our household uh, in the last two years. My father's death and now my mother's recent move here to Cleveland. We've had to break down a household that took 60 years to formulate. Of course, some things you give away, some things you sell, some things you store, some things you keep. I've ended up in possession of my parents' high school yearbooks from 1951 to 1955. And I was looking at those the other night with some focus. I'd seen them before, but never really paid them much attention. Again, these books are from 1951 to 1955. It was like entering a time machine, looking at these old photos. And when you read what people would write, everybody said, you're really swell. <laughs> you're just the swellest girl, people would say to my mother. 
you sure are a swell guy, people would say to my father. It wasn't retro in the 1950s. Everything good was swell. My sister and I came along in the 1970s and 1980s as far as junior high and high school, and we had some of the same teachers that my parents had had, and we knew that there was a connection. So I'm going to be very straightforward. I know this is online. There will be a record of this. These teachers that had taught both my parents and then my sister and me, I just thought they were ancient. <laughs> I thought they were like dinosaurs roaming the earth still. They just looked so old to me when I was in the eighth grade or the ninth grade. It turns out, with further thought, they were the same age then as I am now. <laughs> They were really probably 60. They weren't really nearly as old as I thought. Here's the point. In looking at those old annuals from my parents' era, the teachers that I knew as heading for retirement, my parents knew them when they were just out of college, fresh-faced. You could see the enthusiasm shining through their faculty photos. I knew them when they were nearing retirement. My parents knew them when they were just out of college and had their whole lives ahead of them. What I thought about the other night for the first time was these people whom I just thought of as being really old back in the day gave their adult lives to public education in our hometown. They had welcomed students for 30 years, some of them. Think about that faithfulness, that perseverance. Think about the graciousness in welcoming generation after generation of young people. It was really humbling I thought about the teachers that I had who had taught my parents and I realized anew how dedicated they were to persevere all those years, to keep on that first day of school welcoming, welcoming students. It was humbling to see the continuity from my parents' era to mine. And some of those teachers even taught after my sister and I had graduated. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, Jesus said. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. My conclusion is this. This is the missionary discourse. And when we think about missionary work, we mostly, mostly think about being sent and doing things. And that's right. We are sent. But if we're sent, we have to be received, don't we? Or nothing happens. The reception is just as important as the going out. They have to work together, don't they, for the desired result to happen. I never thought about when I was in school, just thinking, my gosh, those teachers taught my parents. I admired their perseverance, even in real time. I didn't really appreciate their faithfulness to their calling of welcoming students in the next step of their education. Oftentimes, as Christians, we are called to serve Sometimes we're called to receive. My point is the receiving is just as important as the serving. So I close with this. In preparing for the sermon, I came across this comment by an anonymous commentator. We are all, to a large extent, not so much what we have done or accomplished but a constellation of the good we have received 
from the hands of others. Amen.